Late. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we, we are here and we are ready to start. And I have one other mistake I need to apologize for in advance. I gave you a handout and it had the wrong header on it. It's made okay. up. So I apologize for that. It says it's for off campus writers, not sisters in crime. And I, and that's my bad again. So hopefully that'll be the only two mistakes I make today. <laughs> <laughs> okay well did, did you want me to introduce you libby or you want to just jump sure. right? no you go ahead okay well, introduce yourself lynn oh, oh, don't forget that's true uh i'm lynn slaughter and i am the new uh president of derby rotten scoundrels which is the ohio river valley chapter of sisters in crime we are absolutely thrilled to have uh, Libby with us today. I could probably go on and on about all of her writing accomplishments, her workshops, her podcasts. Uh, this woman is a dynamo. <laughs> uh, she is the Chicago-based uh, author of 16 novels. Uh, she has uh, written, and she, of course, they've won many awards. Uh, she's written about private eyes, amateur sleuths, police. She's also penned four standalone historical thrillers. Her most recent release is uh, A Bend in the River, which is somewhat of a departure from the kinds of things she's done before. This is a very stunning piece of historical fiction. It is about two young Vietnamese sisters in 1968 who uh, lose their entire family in a bloody massacre. And the story is about uh, their struggle for survival and the very different paths that they take. So I hope you're gonna check out A Bend in the River and, and all of Libby's other works. And now I'm gonna shut up and uh, let Libby uh, take over here. So welcome, Libby. Thank you, Lynn. What a lovely introduction. You make it sound like I'm much more important than I am. <laughs> I, don't think I am so. as tired most of the time. <laughs> so, so, um, and you can't possibly not see the book because um, it's now on the wall. So that's the, <laughs> of the new book should you want to um, explore. Right. But you know what? It, it's really funny. It, it is not a mystery. It is not a thriller of any sort, but it does have inherent suspense in it. And I used all the techniques that I'm going to share with you today um, to keep readers, you know, as a way to keep readers reading and turning the pages and losing sleep, because that's the biggest compliment that um, anyone can give me is, oh, I stayed up all night to finish your book. You know, who wouldn't, who of us wouldn't want to hear that? Right. So um, how many of you are currently writing um, any sort of crime fiction, whether it's mysteries or thrillers or, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Okay, great. <laughs> Pretty much everybody. Um, is someone writing something other than that? Um, Libby, I think most of them are on mute, but uh, oh, okay. raise, raise your hand if, or type something in. Yeah, you can use it. that little hand raise thing down in the reactions. Oh, romantic romantic sense. Sense. Cool. Yeah, that's the same, oh, okay. same, same. I lump it all into the same genre. Um, where where it is suspense but so before i ever wrote suspense i read it a lot of it i loved robert ludlam john le carré i loved ken ken follett even before he started writing historicals lynn dayton um call them all the l's and you know of course back then except for um what's her name uh, who wrote the vienna book uh, Chris, uh switzerland book she, they were all men back then. Um, but I still love that spine tingling feeling that you have that inability to put a book down. And so I always knew that when I started writing, suspense was going to be a big hallmark of what I did. Um, in fact, I first developed this workshop as a way to teach myself what I was doing, <laughs> because I was doing it kind of like slapdash, you know, what I'd read in the books, and I had no idea whether I was doing it right, but people kept saying, oh, your books are so suspenseful, and I'm like, gee, I wonder why. <laughs> so, so I developed this workshop, and it's turned out to be one that has, uh, uh, it's evergreen. It's, it's lasted, you know, a lot of years now, and I love teaching other people about it the way um, I was taught 
way I, I learn so that um, I can make sure you're doing it effectively. It's really a critical element of plotting. And it's not just in, in crime fiction, as I, as I just mentioned. But let, before we go there, I'd like to ask some of you and um, just unmute yourselves if you want to answer the question. How would you define suspense? I guess I, I would define it as uh, keeping the reader worried about what's going to happen next. Exactly. Keeping them uh, very nervous. Uh, Francis? Mm. Francis, you had your, your Eileen? Yes. Uh, she, Francis, I think, said something that um, makes you want to keep turning the page. Yes, yeah. makes you want to keep turning the page. To me, that's suspense. You're reading the book at night, you're getting sleepy, you get to the end of the chapter and you go, but no, I can't but stop I right now. <laughs> I've yeah. got to go one more page and see what happened. Well, yes, it keeps you on the edge of Keeps yeah. you on the edge of your seat, Lynn. Yes, yeah. absolutely, that's, that's yeah. true. Okay, I'm going to propose an experiment for... Um, all of you. I want you to think about one of your neighbors. It should be one that you're not particularly fond of, someone that gets on your nerves. But I want you to imagine that you're inviting them over for a cup of coffee. Nothing important. The two of you are just going to chat and pass the time of day. You're, you've decided to be neighborly. Okay. Now, I want you to go to your kitchen drawer and pull out the roll of duct tape that you, you always have in your kitchen chore to repair tears and things, you know, that you just don't want to sew up or something. Okay. And I want you to tie your neighbor's hands and feet together and take them to the gym. Okay. And then I want you to go to your closet and pull out your 38. Whoa. <laughs> I want you to release the cylinder, which you can't do on this toy gun, <laughs> and give it a spin. And then I want you to put one bullet, only one bullet in the cylinder and then close it up. Now, I want you to go back to your neighbor who's tied up, sit down in your chair and put the gun against your neighbor's head. And I want you to go back to that, that, that friendly neighborly conversation you were having with one exception. Once a minute, every minute, pull the trigger. I guarantee you that that conversation is going to be the most suspenseful conversation you and your neighbor have ever had. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? It's because suspense isn't about what's happening as what may happen. And a lot of you sort of put your finger on it when you said, you know, I, I, I've got to see what happens. It's about anticipation. It's and often anticipating the worst, like getting shot in the head with a, <laughs> with, a, with a toy gun. Um, it's about cre creating an uncertain situation in which the outcome is in doubt. It's asking a question that's not immediately answered, raising a concern that's not immediately addressed, posing a threat that's not immediately resolved, parceling out information as you go. Notice that immediately is one of the key words that I, that I said. Suspense can depend on stretching out time, delaying answers as long as it's possible for you to do that. The longer you stretch, the longer you parcel out information, the more suspense you're going to have. Okay, and that sort of gets us into, all right, how do we create those situations? Um, before we do that, there's one more thing I just want to make sure that you understand. Um, the difference is, I mean, it's not so, so much important. It's not critical anymore because the tropes that define our genre are really muddy right now. And people say, I'm writing a mystery. And other people say, oh, I'm writing a <laughs> And most people say, well, I'm writing a mystery thriller or I'm writing romantic suspense. And I want you to know the difference, just, just so you know. Mystery is when the reader is on the same page as the protagonist. 
you know everything the protagonist knows. You see every clue as he or she discovers it until the very end when the protagonist skips ahead and as resolved has put those clues together to figure out who it is that's done it. Um, it's a cerebral exercise. It ex it's a real puzzle. That's where they find, that's where they say you have the puzzle element of it. Um, it's a whodunit. A who done it and why. Um, the sleuth can be an amateur sleuth, it can be a professional sleuth, but generally they're solving other people's problems, solving a murder that happened at the coffee shop or you know at you know at the school or at someplace else. Um, it also starts with a large canvas, you know, the whole town, the whole country. But as you get into the book, it narrows down until you're really only dealing with a couple of suspects and the protagonist. And whether that's, you know, in, a, in, a, in one part of the town or, but the, the canvas narrows as the, as the story proceeds. Thrillers, on the other hand, are totally the opposite. Thrillers are gut, gut changers. Thrillers are emotional. Thrillers, thrillers get you and, um, you know, it's not cerebral. It's, it's, it's intuitive and it just, it, that's where most of your suspense comes from. Thriller, in a thriller, you often know who did it at the beginning of the book. And you may even know why they did it. The question is, are the good guys going to keep the bad guys from doing it again? Okay. So you need to keep that in mind, or will they be able to prevent it in the first in the, in the first place? Um, instead of a professional or an amateur sleuth, the hero of a thriller can be just an average Joe. I mean, um, you know, I mean, he could be a CIA, he could be a, a you know an FBI agent, but a lot of times, like in Harlan Coben's books, just an average schmo in the suburbs riding the train to work, and. Um, Perhaps he's unskilled and he's trying to solve his own troubles before he runs out of time. And that's another issue we're going to talk about because thrillers or suspense often depends on time. Um, suspense you usually start small with, the, with, the, with someone who's got a problem that he's got to, he or she's got to solve pretty quickly, but it can grow as more people get involved and the canvas enlarges until sometimes like with, you know, Forsyth or Follett or, you know, you're, 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 you're covering the whole world because you don't know where, where the bad guys are or maybe they're all over the world. So mystery, give, uh, mystery is cerebral. Thrillers give us that, that um, visceral reaction, grabs us by the throat and won't let go. Um, in fact, there should be an emotional response on the part of your readers when you're writing thriller-esque passages or passages with suspense, so much so that in the very, very best suspense novels, it is virtually impossible to put the book down. But as I said, there's suspense in every, almost every piece of fiction. I mean, think of your, think of your favorite novels, To Kill a Mockingbird, Catch-22, Catcher in the Rye, Great Gatsby, um, and to go back even further, Moby Dick, you know, even Charles Dickens, What's Gonna Happen to Poor Little Oliver, or, you know, even um, modern writers, uh, Jodi Picoult, as far as I'm concerned, writes incredible thrillers because she always has that twist at the end and she knows suspense. She knows how to develop suspense. Um, Khalid Hos Hosseini, when he wrote uh, the, the Thousand Splendid Sons, which I thought was even better than The Kite Runner, had a lot of suspense in it. So bottom line, it really doesn't matter what genre or what trope we think we're writing. Creating suspense is an integral part of fiction and it and it should be. So um, let's start at the beginning. And this will be an exercise. So take out your piece, take out a piece of paper and a pencil. Anyone, um, well, anyway, let's start. You can hook your reader 
with your opening sentence of your book. And um, one of your handouts has a list of opening sentences from, from um, writers who are pretty, pretty well known. Um, the small boys came early to the hanging is the first line of Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett, which I just finished. I can't believe I had never read one of his historicals. I've read a lot of his thrillers, but I, I had not read one of his historicals. It's still an incredibly provocative first sentence. Can someone tell me why? Well, you're Im immediately curious about uh, who's getting hung and where they are and what's going on. Who are the small boys? What are they doing at a hanging? Yeah. You know, who's getting hanged? Why? You know, suddenly you need to read the second sentence because, you know, you've got you've to find out some answers here. It just, it just was, you know, suspenseful. Frederick Forsyth in The Fist of God, the man with 10 minutes to live was laughing. Same idea. Uh, Francis Isles, before the fact, some women give birth to murderers, some go to bed with them, and some marry them. Could have been gaslight, huh? Uh -huh. Um, for the Kent Kruger, Iron Lake, first book, for a week, the feeling had been with him, and all week long, young Paul LeBeau had been afraid. Who's Paul LeBeau? What's he afraid of? Why a week? You know, a lot of good things in that first sentence from Kent. Then you can also add humor. It doesn't have to be always, you know, very serious, although that's what I usually mm -hmm. prefer. Ricky Feldman is best admired from a distance. If you get too close, you might find some of your body parts missing. <laughs> well, that's what I used in an image of death. I was trapped in the house with a lawyer, a bare-breasted woman, and a dead man. The rattlesnake in the paper sack only complicated matters. It's from Earl Emerson, who is, was a very funny, funny, funny writer. And one that is my all-time favorite is Victor Gishler. I turned the Chrysler onto the Florida Turnpike with Rollo Kramer's headless body in the trunk, and all the time, I'm thinking, I should have put some plastic down. <laughs> I just like that for the sheer noirness of, of the first sentence. It's humorous, but it's also pretty awful and horrendous. So the easiest way to hook your reader with your opening sentence is to start right in the middle of the action. Think about where your first three chapters are going and then start your first sentence right in the middle of the first real piece of action in your book. The reader, in that, in that way, the, um, oops, let me turn off my, there. In that way, the reader already knows that something's happening, but they have to keep reading to find out exactly what is happening. Um, the reader has to catch up to you. You can do that in narration, or you can do it in dialogue. It works just as well. Um, in uh, my second novel, what was it called? Um, A Picture of Guilt. The first sentence was, the raft plunged straight down and slammed into a wall of water. Um, in dialogue, I did a shot to die for, what do you mean you're not coming? You were supposed to meet me. We had a date. So whether it's dialogue or narrative, you can hook your reader. So what I'd like you to do right now is let's take about six or seven minutes and I'd like you to think about the first line that you've got already. And if it doesn't measure up to those, the, the kinds of criteria we were just talking about, Let's change it, give you a new first sentence.
And I'm going to turn myself off for just a second here. Need two min two more minutes. Libby, this is Susan. I'm just just a question. Would it help if I asked everyone to unmute so they could speak, or is it preferable? No, you know what? Um, you, if you would, I'm going to ask people if they would like to read their first sentence, and if they'd like to just just uh, just put me the word me, and I'll see your name in the chat. We'll just read four or five of them. Okay. 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 All right. We've got plenty of people who have volunteered. Um, Jeanette, Jeanette Pope, would you unmute yourself and read, read the first sentence? Okay. Can you hear me? Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. As she drifted off to sleep beside her husband of two years, her heart filled with joy, but tomorrow she would start proceedings to divorce him. She would start what? Proceedings to divorce him. Oh, okay. Not bad. Not bad. That's a nice little shockeroo. I try to make it a little more concise, but nice, nice. Okay. 
Francis Ayler. Hi, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. Uh, first sentence. Looking down was a big mistake. Ooh. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I was going to say usually starting a sentence with an ing word with a with a gerund is not a great idea, but that was so short and so dramatic that it works. So that's great. What 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 what? What, what, what did she see when she looked down, or he? <laughs> Tell me, I gotta well, know. What, what you find out in this first scene is that she is paragliding in Switzerland 4,000 feet up in the air. Woo! Love it, love it, that was, that was great. Thank you. Okay, uh, T.E. MacArthur. Howdy. Hey. Okay. <clears throat> He refused to believe in ghosts, despite the disembodied whispers telling him he was about to join them. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's good, too. Hey, you guys have the hang of it already. This is terrific. <laughs> Millie Hast? I think I killed him. <laughs> Hello. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. Like it. Can't get much more. Uh, you can't get much more direct than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. Um, all right, Diana, Barr. So it's decided. We're telling them at dinner Saturday. Oh. Hmm. You know what I'd like? I, I'd like it, but I'd like it. I'd like you to add something so it's decided. They're going to hate it, but we're, we'll tell them on Saturday, right? You know, some inference of, of what the reaction's going to be. They're going to they're gonna hate us or they're going to, you know, they're going to love it. It's like in the next one, I say, I know my dad will be happy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, you know, she says, it drives me crazy. We have to do this behind their back. Okay. So kind of dragging it out. And it's kind of a prologue that I kind of left out. Yeah. Then it's kind of sets up. It kind of sets things up. Um, it, does it happen concurrently with the rest of the action? Um. The woman's speaker winds up dead. But I mean, the prologue that you're writing, does it happen like, you know, oh. within, in the, in the same time period as- oh, Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, in that yeah. case, I, I, that's funny that you talked, you said the word prologue, because that leads me to the next point I was gonna make, um, I, which I did wanna talk about for a second. Um, there's always lots of discussion in the mystery world um, between whether one should have a prologue or not have a prologue. Um, you know, some people love them, others absolutely hate them. But they can be pretty effective at creating suspense if the, um, if it describes a secret that will drastically alter the lives of the characters or the course of events. Um, and particularly if it goes back to the past to show where the seed of that secret first came from, um, it can be very, very effective. But when it's in the same time frame as the rest of the book, I just call it chapter one. Yeah. Yeah. Not really, not really call it a prologue because it is, I mean, if it's the same time frame, it's just right. before the rest of the book. So just call I, it chapter one. I did that originally. Yeah. And I had one person say, yeah, I like this. And then someone else say, I would just dump it completely. <laughs> so it's like. But leave it in and just call it chapter one. Doesn't yeah. have to be that long, you know. And, and then after you finish the book and you're polishing and you're editing it, you can decide whether you want to leave it in or not leave it in. Right. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. All right. I think we have time for one more. Um, let's see. 
Shelley Margolin Mayer. Okay. Did she not hear me? Shelley, you are up. And you may need to unmute yourself. Yes, you will need to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. I was just putting it in the chat. I thought we could do that. No, 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 no. Okay. Um, I'd rather have everyone hear it. Okay. Over the past six years, I, April Sparks, have only beaten Claus Sandusky to the front door on rare occasions. Ooh, it sounds like a kid talking. Is it? Is it a, is it a young? No, it, it's a, a um, uh, postal carrier <laughs> and a cat. Okay. I'd make it, I, is there any way to raise the stakes? Um, make it more? Yeah. Is it, a, is it a day that he delivers something really, really important? Um, no, not so much. It's more of um, uh, showing the relationship. Well, at this point, it's, it's, it's showing a fight between the cat and the uh, mail carrier. The cat and the mail. Oh, 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 okay. So the next thing he does, uh, uh, um, the cat, uh, they're ra racing each other to um, the mail slot where the cat actually keeps the mail from going into the mail slot. Where's the dead body? Who's Who gets murdered? The next door neighbor. So the, it's a, this is a, a, a cozy mystery and the um, sleuth is the mail carrier. Ah. And this is just defining who. Um, okay. I, you know, I would, I would love to get a mention of the next door neighbor. You know, something like uh, Mrs. Maple was, was watching on the only day I beat Claus Sandusky. I see what you're saying. Okay, so you know that makes it more who, what, what? What are we talking so, about here? So the victim should be in the first sentence. Well, it could. She could be, and it would make a lot more sense than just the claws, the cat, and the postman. I see. Would have people in it, and there would, you know, Miss. I saw Mrs. Maple looking out from her window on the only day I beat San, you know, claws to uh -huh. the front door or something like that. I see what you're saying. You know, just just raise the stakes a little bit, but okay, good good idea. Okay, now let's go to the other end of the chapter. Let's go to the end of the chapter, where you do something that we call the sting otherwise known as a cliffhanger. And you can do that. Um, you can't, you should not overdo it. It should not be in every chapter, but uh, in important chapters where you want suspense and you want the reader to keep reading, you can do a cliffhanger that would uh, say something like, it would go like something like this. Petrovsky started the Buick and pulled out of the lot. Davis backed out and swung the wheel left. The car went into a skid. Fuck, she muttered under her breath. I belted myself in. Um, ponytail plunged the needle into his chest. The old man's hands flew up. The dog biscuit fell and skittered across the floor. He was arrested a few weeks ago and he's still in jail. They say he killed a teenage girl. So often, remember what I said about parceling out information? That last sentence can be the sentence where you parcel out, you give them another piece of information. They say he killed a teenage girl. Not only is that suspenseful, but it's a way of parceling out information. Can anyone think of a book where it was overdone to the point where I literally threw the book across the room and didn't finish it? The author did it in every darn chapter. You know it. It's very well. 
Yeah, somebody said in the, in, somebody already said, Brooke, you're right. What book, what book is it? Da Vinci Code. You got it. <laughs> a prize. A prize. <laughs> I mean, I read the first hundred pages and I said, this is the best book I've ever read. And then I stick, he kept going and kept going with these cliffhangers and with these stings. And I'm like, what is this all about? This is silly. And, and um, then when I realized what he was doing, I just said, Ugh, this piece of trash. Yeah. Little do I know. <laughs> like a zillion other people didn't, didn't agree with me, but hey, what we, what we can do. Okay, so we won't exercise, we won't do an exercise on sting, but just remember that you can do it. Um, and, but be careful that you don't overdo it. You know, once every, yeah, I don't know, six or, I, depending on your chapter lengths, you can do it. And you can also save a little nugget of information to reveal on that last sentence in the chapter. Okay, so now let's move into the body of your book, which is really where most of the suspense takes place. Um, maybe you've heard editors or you've, <laughs> unfortunately, I remember this uh, stage a lot where I've got reviews uh, back from agents and editors say to me, you know, uh, you know, this really isn't compelling enough. You know, what, what are they saying? What, what, what was she really saying to me? What she was saying is, what's at stake here? Or the stakes aren't high enough. You must continually raise the stakes in your books, if in your plot, if you want to have suspense in it. Uh, what they're telling, what, what that woman who said I wasn't that compelling was telling me was there wasn't enough emotional investment in the story and the character by the reader. So how do you build that investment? You continually raise the stakes, increase the danger, increase the possibilities for disaster, and by that, doing that, you will be building suspense at every possible turn. Now we're going to talk about a number of different ways where you can do that, raise the stakes. Okay, perhaps the most common one um, is to create complications for your characters, for your protagonist especially. Confront the, con the protagonist with obstacles, with dangers, with events that he or she must deal with and overcome before they can move on. It, it could be a, a small complication. It could be that, uh, you know, his, his, his uh, cell phone only has 5% juice left, or it could be a huge complication where a man with a gun is pointing it straight at him. But whatever it is, there's got to be an obstacle that the protagonist, and sometimes the antagonist too, has to deal with. He has to go off of the beat, he has to go off of the straight and narrow path, deal with this obstacle, and then get back onto the, 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 the path that he, was, he or she was following, solve the mystery, or find, you know, escape the danger. Um, here's another example. Let's say a heroine starts to undress thinking she's alone and safe, but at the same time, unbeknownst to her, the bad guys are climbing up the fire escape. The suspense comes from the hidden danger that the reader knows about, but the woman who's undressing does not know about. We wonder, oh my God, is she going to hear them in time? I hope she hears them in time. Come on, lady, listen for them. There's somebody out there that's going to do you harm. It's kind of like the, the person in the closet that's going to jump out. Um, by the way, that's what we mean when we say that the reader is ahead of the protagonist. That wouldn't, that, it could happen in a mystery, but most often it would have in a more thrill, happen in a more thriller-esque setting that we know what the protagonist doesn't know. And we're rooting for her to find out before it's too late. That's raising the stakes. Um, you can also create a complication that is just out of left field. It just, it, it, you just don't know where it, 
where it where it happens. Does does any and now this was not in the book Double Indemnity, but how many people of you have seen the movie Double Indemnity Indemnity with Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck? Okay, if you haven't seen it, watch it tonight. You can watch it for free tonight. I'm sure that it's someplace it's free. There's a scene right after um, they kill Barbara Stanwyck's husband and they leave him on the railroad tracks and they're running away from the railroad tracks to their car to get away before anyone sees that there's a body on the railroad tracks. And Fred McMurray is driving the car and he puts the key in the lock and he turns it and nothing happens. It's like the car stalls and the camera goes from Fred to the keys to Barbara Stanwyck back to the keys. McGurry tries it again and nothing happens. And now they're getting really worried. And, you know, the, the close ups go from one to the other, back to the keys, back to, you know, and we're getting worried, even though they're the bad guys. It's like, they're not going to get away. They're going to get caught. Somebody's going to find them. And that's going to be the end of the movie. Well, we know that. And then finally, he does it like a third or a fourth time, and the car starts and they leave. But that little piece of business, which wasn't in the book, was such a fabulous, suspenseful technique that I always want to mention it because it's something that's way out of left field that you just would never expect the car dying, the cell phone dying, you know, whatever. Um, it, it helps build the stakes, it helps raise the stakes. Okay, we're gonna be talking about another way to raise the stakes a little bit later on when we talk about time. Um, because time, putting a limit on time or having a deadline is also a, a major way to raise the stakes and build suspense. You know, when you think about the ticking bomb, you know, we all know it's there and we don't know when it's gonna go off. Um, and we bite our fingernails wondering whether the good guy's gonna find it in time or is it gonna be blown to smithereens, you know? And it's the same idea of building the stakes. Okay, another approach to suspense and building, building suspense and, and creating obstacles for your characters is something what I, that I call the four outcomes. And uh, there's a handout for it, so you have it someplace, um, and you can read it slowly tonight after this after the workshop. But um, Carolyn Wheat, who, by the way, wrote a book which I still refer to this to this day, she delineates the difference between mystery and a thriller, and she kind of deconstructs. I forget what the mystery is. Oh, it's it's a uh, is it the Jimmy Stewart movie? I don't know. But the thriller is Hostage, um, which Bob um, Crace wrote. One of his, I think that was his breakout book. Anyway, um, she says, the character always wants something in the here and now, in any scene. The question is whether he's going to get it. And she says, there are four possible outcomes. Yes, he's going to get what he wants, and the story or the chapter ends. No, he's not going to get what he wants, and the chapter ends, but it ends with, you know, kind of sadly. Um, yes, then, the, then there's, yes, he's going to get what he wants, but there are conditions attached. He's going to have to give up his firstborn daughter. If he wants what it, if he wants to get what they want from him, or no, and furthermore, I'm going to kill your little dog too. So there are. Carolyn Wheat says yes and no. Do not build suspense. They cut it off right, you know, right when you want it. But yes, but you know, um, in in the movie. Um, the Christmas movie with Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed. It's a wonderful life. Yeah. Boy. Yes, but the, the, you know, Potter says, and I'm going to have to pay the mortgage right now, too. Or no, but furthermore, I'm going to kill your little dog, too, from The Wizard of Oz. Those are the answers that you want to have in your writing. 
because it makes it more exciting and it puts conditions and criteria against the yes and the no. And the protagonist has to morally weigh whether the conditions or the criteria are worth getting what he wants or not getting what he wants. So um, yes and no do not drive plot or suspense. Yes, but, and no furthermore do. So um, I have, I think I don't know if I gave you a handout with, um, yeah, I think I did give you a handout with how it worked in um, the, the Jimmy Stewart movie. So think about that when you're writing a scene of conflict or when the character wants something. Okay, there's another way to raise the stakes. And that is to think of the worst case scenario that could happen in a scene and then make it worse. Um, Kent Kruger did that really beautifully in his third book called Purgatory Ridge. I don't know if uh, any of you ever read it. It's, he's got so many books now, it's hard to keep them all straight. But in, um, in that book, two women and three children have been kidnapped by a man um, and taken to a little cabin in the woods in the middle of a Minnesota winter which is freezing and uh, in the woods, you know, there's nothing there and um, they're in the wilderness. They have no idea where they are. Um, and the women do try to fight him and escape and they actually do try to risk their lives and those of their children. Again, you know, they'd rather be in the, in the forest making their way to freedom and hold up in the cabin with this madman with the gun, but he overpowers them. And so it's kind of looking really, really grim. So you'd think that that was the worst case scenario and what, what were they going to do? But then Kent's got another one for you. He says, and if that wasn't enough, it turns out that one of the kids is diabetic and if he doesn't get his insulin, he's gonna die. Oh. So that's what I mean by making a worst case scenario and then making it worse. So, okay, that's, uh, wait, there's, there's still more. There's still more coming. If there's um, any questions, let me see. Oh, you worked on your mystery with Carolyn Wheat. Yes, she is brilliant. She was brilliant. She really was. Um, did she pass? I don't, I don't know, Erica. I assume that she did because I haven't heard her name for a while, but I'm, I'm not sure. Anyway, Carolyn, wait. Really. Um, <laughs> the psychopath is preferable by far. That's funny. <laughs> That's great, Meredith. I love that. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe possible. Okay. Okay, still another way to raise the stakes. Yes, I know Kent is from Minnesota. Um, that's why he knows, the, he knows the woods so well and he knows the seasons so well. Um, still another way to raise the stakes is to tempt your protagonist with no-win situations and see what he or she is made of. For example, Choosing, he has, she, he or she has to choose one person to live while the other one is going to die. Or forcing um, an alcoholic to pick up a drink when they've been sober for 15 years. Or same thing with an addict, you know, shooting him up with heroin after he's been clean for a long period of time. When a protagonist has to face questions of morality and ethics and his own beliefs, um, it creates tension and tension is suspense. So that's another way that you can, you can do something. Um, the final way we're gonna talk about in this section is 
to isolate the protagonist. Um, throughout the story, the protagonist becomes more and more removed from his or her familiar world. Um, think of Ludlum's born identity where um, Jason Bourne has to perform a number of tasks by himself without help from the rest of the team. He has to use his wits rather than some cool toys or, or you know, machines or things that had been developed for him. Um, we come to root for him because we know that he's working on his own. I mean, he's working on fumes, you know, rather than having the full support. Um, the rest of the team kind of disappears and goes away. This is one of the best ways for you as a writer to um, establish close identification with the protagonist. I mean, we want Jason Bourne to succeed in the movie. We want, or in the book, even though, you know, he's, he doesn't know who to trust and we don't know who to trust either. And so we're rooting for him. Um, so that's a really good way. Um, I did it in um, Easy Innocence, my first Georgia Davis book. Um, I had her pretty much trying to solve a murder on her own. All the people that she had come to rely on were gone. And then there's a fire in her apartment. And um, she's just, you know, she's on her own. She doesn't have anything. The fire guts pretty much everything that she owns. So um, one thing that you can also do um, is to include the antagonist or the villain's character from time to time. Um, it strengthens suspense and you can build on that. Um, give, give the reader reasons why the antagonist is doing what he's doing. We don't really want, you know, you don't have to go to far as go so far as to make him likable or to make us feel sorry for him. But at least if we can understand why he's motivated to destroy or kill or blow up the world or why he killed the, the woman at the, the cafe, we'll, we'll, we'll understand better the stakes in the whole thing. Maybe he's, he, uh, what was that book? It was a, it was a Robert Crace book. You know, it looked like for half the book, it, it seemed like it was a, a story about, um, a guy who, um, a woman that needed to be protected from some men that were stalking her. And, uh, we didn't know why. And then he drops a piece of information that lets us know that, the woman's mother had a relationship with one of the guys that was stalking her and that there was something like $50,000 that she had absconded with and it was somewhere and they wanted to find it. And I love when that, I love when that happens because you think the book's about one thing and then all of a sudden you realize it's about something else altogether. And that to me is a great use of suspense and just, makes makes me tingle um so however you do it whether it's just going to be you know the thought process as as the bad guy is hiding in a closet or or whether it's going to be direct confrontation or whether it's going to be a 90 degree turn in your story you have the reader has to believe in this situation it has to be credible uh, the problem I think that we have as, as writers, as, as when we first start out, is that um, we, we tend to stereotype the good guys and the bad guys. We don't mean to. We mean to give them depth and not make them cardboard characters. But in some ways, they, be, they do become cardboard ca characters. Now, if they're only on and off the the stage or the scene, you know, if they're only in one or two scenes, you can afford to do that. But if it's the real antagonist and if it's the guy that's really holding up the good guy, you have to um, understand that 
the hero, the bad guy always thinks he's a hero. That's the catch. The good guy might think he's a hero. The bad guy always thinks he's, he's a hero in his own story. He never thinks he's wrong. He's doing this for all the right reasons. And I won't go on because I'll say something I don't want to say. <laughs> um, the, the thing that you want to avoid is, uh, <laughs> some of you are already smiling. I know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Um, the thing is that you can't have, um, and Mary, Mary Higgins Clark used to do this and it used to really tick me off. It's called Deus Ex Machina, something like just drops from heaven that all of a sudden makes us understand something. And it's not credible. It's kind of like, huh, where'd this come from? Why is this here? Why is this, is this why the bad guy is, you know, a bad guy? What, what? you know, it, it, it doesn't make sense. It's just not credible if you think about it. So you have to make sure that the reason that the bad guy is, it feels like he's a hero in his own story is going, your, your audience is going to believe it. There's something in the way that he's acted before, or there's something in, in his, uh, you know, in his DNA, maybe maybe he had a uh, you had a childhood scene with him where he exhibited some of the characteristics that have now manifested him as an adult. I mean, maybe he used to pick the wings off flies, or I mean, that's kind of stereotyped. But you know, maybe he just did stuff that um, I'm okay. I'm reading this biography of Joe McCarthy, um, you know, from Wisconsin because I think I'm going to write a, a book about. McCarthy here's next. And from the time he was a little boy, he was like always acting out. He was always acting toward other people. He was always being, you know, chummy and friendly and, you know, oh, you come with me, boy, we'll have a great time. Yeah, da, 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 da. And, and that was part of his DNA. So if I ever really write about him, if I ever make him a character, I was not really good thinking of making him a character in the book, just the McCarthy era. Um, you know, that would be something that I would put in this scene of uh, including the villain's character. Um, okay. Now I'm going to, let's turn to, do any of you need a, a little bit of a break? We're almost, uh, you know what? Yeah. We'll, we'll keep going because we'll have a break in about 10 minutes. How does that sound? Mm -hmm. um, another way to build suspense is something that I call structural misdirection. Other ways to describe it much, much more simply are red herrings and MacGuffins. Okay, a red herring is a character or a clue or an event that's designed to mislead the reader and sometimes even the protagonist. The best example I can give you is the end of The Sopranos. Remember the ending of The Soprano was so suspenseful and you saw this dirty, slimy guy at the bar and you said, uh-oh, Tony, Carmela are gonna get it. And then the kids were parking their cars and not knowing how to park their cars. And there was a bunch of French fries on the table that, that, that Carmela was dipping in ketchup. And then the dirty guy goes into the bathroom and we're saying, oh my God, we know, we remember from The Godfather, there's a gun that's gonna be taped to the wall of the bathroom or under the toilet. Oh my God, this is it. And we go back out and he comes back out and he goes back to the bar and we're like, oh my God, and you know, your fingers. And what happens? Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. The screen goes to black and then Journey comes on and sings that wonderful song and the series is over. And that to me was the best structural misdirection I have ever seen. And I'm sorry that it was in a movie and not a book because it was fantastic. They had, I was so wrapped up in the suspense. I thought I was going to have a heart attack right there and nothing happened. So that's what I mean by structural misdirection. You really think something's going to happen and it isn't. Uh, the MacGuffin is just a more complex red herring. Um, here you can actually create, you can get more complicated. You can, you can create more, um, characters and subplots that um, 
create a possible scenario or motive for the crime. But um, when you do that, and you finally, and, and um, uh, Hitchcock did this in um, Maltese Falcon. I mean, you know that Peter Laurie and Sidney Greenstreet had these roles to play and everything, but we get right down to it. They were just distracting Humphrey Bogart from going after the Falcon. And um, so it was, it was a very, and he coined, it, Hitchcock coined the term MacGuffin. So I, I could get into more of it, but I won't take up your time. He was the master of the MacGuffin. Um, the suspense comes when you actually see through the MacGuffin or the, or the um, red herring, and you see that you've been had. And maybe the protagonist seems like he or she's been had, because once again, he's off the straight and narrow, and he's been distracted. He's been misled to follow off on a, on the, off the beaten path. And time is running out, and, and the danger is increasing, and yet he's been, he's had to deal with this stuff that, that has taken him away from solving the crime. So that's kind of what I mean, mean about it, and we can talk about it more if, if you like, if you like about it, if you like to. Um, we already talked about including the villain's uh, point of view, um, but in very suspenseful climatic scenes, you can shift point of views. Um, you can shift locations, and then you can also shift time. For example, um, if you're shifting POVs, you might say, Mary was in uh, Kentucky and she was doing this. And then you talk a little bit about Mary's. John was in Washington and he was doing this. And meanwhile, Jacques in Paris was doing this. And when you come back to the guy in Kentucky, he finds out what the people in the other locations have or have not done to help him. And it can be very, it can be very uh, suspenseful if he finds out that they didn't do what they promised to do, or if they did and everything is on clockwork and, and things are moving ahead. And this is where you have the, 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 the old uh, clock ticking and the two guys are playing cards and you, 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 you cut, you know, you talk about the clock ticking and then you, you talk about the card, the card game and you go back to the clock ticking and it's less time left. You go back to the clock ticking and then you go back to the guys and you wonder if they know about it. And it's a, it's a real suspenseful technique, which really gets us into the idea of time. And time, when it's used as a deadline, is probably one of the most effective uh, suspenseful techniques that we have. Um, the idea with time is that you want to stretch time. Um, you want to delay as much as possible the passage of time so that people really get a sense of, of the danger escalating and the suspense escalating. In a, in a picture of guilt, for example, I have a, a well now I'm going to tell you the end of the story so you don't Really, I mean, you still need to read it, but you don't have to read it right away. There's a nuclear suitcase bomb. And Ellie and an FBI agent are tracking the suitcase bomb. And I drew it out for four chapters, even though, um, you know, they could have found it in one chapter. Um, and it could go off on any, any, anyway. Now, what are some techniques to doing that? You do something that's called literary slow motion. It's one of my favorite ones. At moments of conflict, like when the villain jumps out of the shadows, you stretch the moment with sensory details. Let's say your hero has been punched and he's on the floor. Describe what he's seeing, the shoes on the floor coming toward him, the lights dimming, his vision is blurring. Then what is he hearing? He's hearing the rustle or he's hearing somebody laugh or he's hearing a gun get uh, cocked, you know, with another cylinder in the barrel. Um, how, what is he feeling? His cheek is rough against the wood floor, or his cheek is surprisingly soft, must be flush carpeting. Um, so you use your sensory details there, and then you end it with a stinger like, his last conscious thought was of blank whatever it was, Mary or his mother or 
I'm going to, I'm not going to make it or whatever. Um, there's a book called Heat by William Goldman, who is also a filmmaker. And he takes seven pages to describe 18 seconds. He keeps the reader riveted the whole time. In other words, what it does is it slows everything down. And Clancy takes it to a millisecond in Red October. Um, all right, let's, let's talk about deadlines. We know there's a deadline. In suspense, the protagonist should always be working against the clock, and the clock, the clock should be working for the bad guys. In Robert Ludlum and Gail Lindsay Altman Code, uh, Covert Agent John Smith only has days to prove, prove the Chinese are sending chemical weapons to Iraq. In Greg Isles' 24 Hours, Will and Karen Jennings have one day to escape their captor and rescue their child who's been kidnapped. Um, and many other literary and cinematic works that aren't mysteries use deadlines. Think of Affair to Remember or Sleepless in Seattle, where they, where they had to get to the top of the uh, Empire State Building by midnight. Think about heist films where they have to get something in a, in a, in a, in a minute or else the alarm's going to go off. Even courtroom dramas where the jury is out and the jury's going to come back in. You know, there's a lot of tension and suspense between, you know, them waiting for the jury to come in and what, the, what they're going to say. Um, terrorist plots, same thing. Um, works, it works every time to build suspense. But you can also, you don't have, you know, you can also use time and deadlines in smaller ways. And, and this is something you can actually write a countdown scene that says where you show the dwindling clock or you write about the dwindling clock. For example, ten, there's a, there was only 10 minutes left. He, he uh, you know, he uh, saw the bad guy running toward him. Um, and then he looked at his watch. There was only five minutes left. The bad guy was only 50 yards away. He looked at his watch again, two minutes way he pulled out his gun and aimed it. So you can actually use the clock to your advantage by writing a, a countdown scene. The same goes for location. You can write a location lockdown, uh, countdown, which I already described in Paris and in Kentucky and in Chicago, in Washington. Um, and it works really well when you can use their points of view as you are cu cutting the scenes. At this point, the scenes would be short. They would be sections of a, of a, of a chapter. Okay. Um, think of the, the, again, this is a movie, but it was also in the book, The Day of the Jackal. At the, you know, it's the only film I've ever seen where you know the end of the movie before you walk in. <laughs> but it's still, you're on the edge of your seat the whole time. The Day of the Jackal is about an assassination attempt against Charles de Gaulle in France. And we all know that Charles de Gaulle was not assassinated. But we, what we didn't know is this is a made up story where someone was trying to assassinate him. A detective of the Sûreté realizes it and the detective is trying to track the assassin and get him before he gets to De Gaulle. I'm not going to tell you the end because it's great. It's a wonderful idea. Um, but it, it is in the way they, they cut between the assassin and the detective. De Gaulle is only in there for a second at the very end. And it's a wonderful story and it's really suspenseful. Okay, now you knew there was going to be an exercise, right? Um, and I, I will answer questions, but here's the exercise. I did, um, I did print it out for you. So you have it on paper and we're going to give, I'm going to give you 10 minutes to write, to write, to complete it. Um, here's the situation and it is, you, it should be written down for you. Your protagonist is going into a building to meet someone who has important information for them. It's an abandoned building in a scary part of town. It's nighttime. He doesn't have any weapons or other protection that 
the reader knows about. He or she does have a cell phone though. I want you to incorporate at least one suspenseful technique that we've just been talking about into that scene. And then after you finish reading it, you tell us which one you used. Or we can all try to guess by writing in the chat what technique he or she was using. Does that make sense to everyone? Does everyone have it? Do you need me to read it again? Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, does anyone have any burning questions that they would like to ask before we break for this exercise? Apollo 11. Yeah, that was a good idea. That, that's exactly, we know what happened to Apollo 11 too. Perfect, perfect analogy. Constantly misleading the reader can't be a good thing, right? Absolutely. You don't want to do it, you know, you only want to do it once or twice, and maybe once in a small way, and then if you want to in a big way. It's, it's like Da Vinci Code. You certainly don't want to do it all the time. Mark Bacon, you have politely raised your hand. Yes. Um, my question is, you talked about uh, prologues and said that um, information in a prologue that's um, in the past is makes it more effective than information that's in the present tense or in the present time. My question is, what about a prologue that is in the future? Never thought of that. It could, it could work. It could definitely work as long as it doesn't give away too much. As long as it, it um, you know, keeps your characters from knowing what's going on. Yeah. And then the, and then the first chapter could say three weeks earlier. Absolutely. That could work. In fact, oh. uh, Lisa Unger, I think it just did her newest book. She did it that way. I might be wrong about that, but. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, it is 119, so we'll call it 120. And at 1.30, we will, I mean 2.30, your time, sorry. I'm on, we will get back together and talk about your exercises. If someone would like to read a couple of them, I know I said we would go an hour and a half and we're going to go a little bit over. I hope you all don't mind. Um, go for it, guys. I'll be right back.
Two more minutes.
Okay, about ready. Um, is, is there anyone there, anyone who would like to volunteer to read your, uh, your passage? You sure. Just, you know, in, in, the, in the, okay, we yeah. have, okay. So we've got three people, four people. All right, stop, stop. <laughs> I really wish, wish we had more time. Okay. Um, who said sure first? Susan, was that you? I think that was me. All right, go right uh, ahead. Okay. She stepped over the discarded cans of paint to reach the warehouse door. From the faint rays of the street light, she saw the door was slightly ajar. She, push, she pushed it open and walked into a cavernous space, empty, except for a single table and chair in the middle of the room and the rat that scampered along the far wall. A door at the end of the room opened and she saw the silhouette of a large man holding a gun. She instinctively reached inside her raincoat for her 38, but remembered she had left it at home. The silhouette moved towards her. Then her cell phone rang. It rang again and again until the silhouette spoke. You might want to take that call. Whoa! This is as far as I got. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> that is great. You had me going there. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that was awesome. Awesome. What's, what suspenseful technique did she use? It was a sting. That sting at the end was just fabulous. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing was well set up. What were you aware of using, Susan? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> surprise a little bit. The the you know, it's a it's a scary space. I mean you told us that. So yeah. I tried to make it a little bit. You know, you go in, it's cavernous, it's almost empty except for the the table and chair, what are they there for? There's a rat running around, uh, and then that silhouette, and and that's scary. I always, seeing someone in a window or coming through a door is a scary thing to me, so it's like, what's going to happen? And then, and then you might want to take that call. That's, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Okay. Hey, Millie, what about Millie Hast? Would you like to read yours? Sure. Um, Bill opened the door to the abandoned building, a crack, and peeked inside. It was so dark he couldn't see anything, but Parker had promised him the child he was searching for was in there, somewhere in that dark void. He stepped in, the door clanged shut behind him. He turned and tried to open it, but it was locked. He scanned the interior of the warehouse, but only saw, saw only blackness. He reached for his phone, but feared the light would reveal his presence. Never mind, he had to find out if the boy was here. He clicked on the phone, but nothing happened. His phone was dead. And then he heard a child's terrified cry. Woohoo! Fun! <laughs> Again, what a great sting that was. And complications, lots of complications. Excellent, well done, well done. Thanks, they say make it worse, so. Yeah, you sure did, you made it. I guess you did that too, I, that was great. That was great. Okay, uh, Zara, 
Zara Altier, did I get that right? You did. I'm unmuting. <laughs> okay. I didn't get to the warehouse yet. <laughs> Uh, all right. The 20 foot fence was hung with sections of local art. Panel after panel lined the road on both sides, blocking the view of acres of stacked lumber. Each section was locked by a padlock on a chain. Axel looked for the open gate. What did the caller said? By the girl? Each panel was a distinct piece of art. Historic local train, the fields in spring, the train station. There it was a young woman in bright colors. He pulled on the padlock by her hand. It opened and he pushed on the panel that rolled back. Inside the yard, piles of lumber created a maze, each aisle dark as a cave between the stacks. Now where? He pulled out his phone to check the message, the phone screen the only light except for a spotlight by the warehouse yards away. You'll find me, was all the message said. He stood blinking, trying to pierce the dark tunnels. He heard a click and a foot grinding something into the asphalt. Okay, enough. Come out. No, you come here. Go to the stack on your left. Axel turned left. There was nothing to distinguish the stacks of lumber or which aisle. He, I'm searching for a verb, strode toward the first black aisle. Wow. That was really stretching time. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, maybe I, a little too much. <laughs> maybe a little. I know. I just like, okay, I'm just going to start this and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so you got, you got, you know, I loved, I loved the part where he finds the girl and he presses on it and it unlocks. That's, that's get key. Keep that part. But, um, you know, you should get, maybe get to the warehouse a little sooner next time. <laughs> I want him to get him to the uh, informant and then to the warehouse. That was very nicely written, um, but it it you need more action. But other than other than that, it was it was nice. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, Virginia Kelly, are you there? She was there, and then and then she just tried to log back in, and I I let her in. So maybe she's okay. connecting. All right, let's do Sarah Lynn Lester while we're waiting. Oh, can you hear me now? Oh yes, now we can. I am so sorry. I am on my cell phone because my internet, my cable is down, and I was trying to unmute myself. My apologies. I no problem. Glad you missed here. Okay, go. Missed, missed, missed a lot. Sorry. Um, this had to be the most idiotic thing he'd ever done to get a story. Midnight <laughs> at a warehouse. Seriously? What did this guy do? Watch bad movies? <laughs> but Sam was here now, no turning back. He got out of the car, pulled the cell from the inside pocket of his jacket, and tapped to call Becky. Shit, no signal. She was going to be pissed at him for being late again. The barely lit front of the metal doorway glistened in the damp air. Cats yowled in the alleyway between buildings. With one last glance at the phone to check the time, he pulled the door open. Ink blackness, ink black darkness welcomed him. Musty air filled his nostrils, followed by a faint scent he scrambled to recognize. The lights flashed on. He startled and stared unbelieving. Becky smiled at him, holding his Glock aimed at him. <laughs> Nicely done. That. Wow, very nicely done. What were you working on besides the, the uh, definitely the sting at the end of the chapter? I guess I was trying to add atmosphere and, and sort of a ticking, yeah. a little bit of a ticking clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love the opening. Are you kidding me? A dark, a dark warehouse at midnight? Are you nuts? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was good. Yeah. yeah. Well done. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Sarah Lynn. Thank you. 
Um, at this point in the novel, because I use my work in progress, we know the point of view character is kind of a jerk. He's a sexist pig, but someone stole his dog. He's trying to get her back. That's where we are. Okay. <laughs> Alex crept around a pillar in the deserted parking garage. Not deserted. Would have been less scary if it were empty. There were no people as far as he could see, but there were cars, lots of places for someone to hide. He listened for the jingle of Stella's collar. Nothing. Then he stopped in the middle of an aisle, right out in plain view. The spider wasn't going to kill him. If that's what he wanted, he could have poisoned Alex's cereal instead of stealing it, shot Alex instead of taking his dog. Alex pulled out his cell phone and texted the number that had told him to meet here. Listened for the buzz. Something to his left. Alex whipped his head around in time to catch a flash of movement, someone in black darting behind an old minivan. So fast. And there was something about the movement that made him think, young. More confident now. Alex straightened and strode toward the empty Toyota Sienna. As he turned sideways to slide between the van and the pickup truck beside it, a light flashed, a door slammed, and something hit him hard right in his gut. Woo! Mm. Nicely done. Lots of action in that, in that sequence. And um, um, not, a, not a, an extra word there. I, I, that was really good. What were you working toward? Um, I was thinking about, you know, the scene where you had somebody undressing while they're, um, somebody's climbing up the fire escape outside, the idea where the um, reader is a little bit ahead of the point of view character. I'm thinking this character is always overly confident, and we're never quite as sure that he's as safe as he's sure he is. Got it. That's the part that I was playing with there. Got it. You can, you can boost that up, too. Okay. You know, he can be more confident, and that, you know, come on, this isn't much, and, but he really is scared. Nicely done, ladies and gentlemen. I really appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to close now with just a, a couple of uh, thoughts on pacing. Because pacing is really important. And most of you have very good pacing on, in the exercise. Um, the judicious use of pacing also adds to suspense, it kind of frames it. The key is to vary your pacing. Think of suspense as a symphony. The chapters are like movements. You want to create pools of calm between the storms. Let readers catch their breath between action sequences. So they'll be like tiny little oases of safety in between. It'll make the action seem even hotter. Uh, limit your backstory. I think you all know that. That's one of the first things you learn. Do it in the prologue. Do, if, if there's going to be backstory and it's going to take place in the past, or the future, do it in the prologue so that when you start the book, we're in the present, not the past. Um, you can create urgency in action scenes. And Sarah Lynn, you did this really well. Um, by speeding up your pace, short sentences, short paragraphs, no extraneous words. Use adjectives sparingly, adverbs not at all crisp dialogue. Don't dwell on violence, be economical. While it is necessary and it is a valid component of suspense, it's kind of like a eroticism, a little, a little goes a long way and less is more. Um, subtlety and suggestion go a lot further than clinical exposure. So like when that guy's on the floor that I, you know, and he'd already been punched, I didn't write about the being punched. I just wrote about the aftermath mm -hmm. of him being punched and what he saw and what he felt and what he heard. So, um, and then the old canards, less is more and show don't tell, which always help. And that's all I have this afternoon. Thank you for hanging in there. It did last a little bit longer than I thought it might, but if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to entertain them right now or we can say, see you around the campus. <laughs> Thank you so Hi. much. Thanks. We are done. Oh, thank you, Libby. That was wonderful. Oh, I'm so, so glad. Much. Yeah, and I, I, loved, uh, I loved having the chance to do the exercise and hear everybody's very, very unique responses. Everybody approached it differently, which is really great. Um, so I really appreciate uh, you've given us a lot to think about and work on. 
So it is a lot of information, but you have the outline. Right. Um, okay. So you can refresh yourself. And if any of you have any questions, I am more than happy to answer them. Just email me. Um, you can get to me through my website. Um, oh, right. And it'll come right to me. So I am delighted to help my fellow sister, my fellow sisters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it's one of the it's one of the perks being yeah. able to share what I've learned with you and I hope that all of you write bestsellers when you're finished your manuscript Me too. <laughs> that would <Yes>. be nice <laughs> and if you did not receive a handout send me an email um, I'm uh, putting my email in the chat and I will make sure you get them. Great. All Great. right. All right. They take a couple of hours. I have dogs that have needs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a cat that's giving me the stink eye. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, Let's go back to our lives. Yes. Thank you. Again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you again, Libby. Okay. It was Wonderful to see all these wonderful writers. Yeah. All right. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. See you soon. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.